Welcome, welcome, welcome. Episode two, the Jim Jackson Show. Now, the scenery may look a little different, as I explained last week uh, on our first show. There are a lot of times that I travel. So the show, every Thursday, but it's Friday. Because as you know, and maybe you don't know, but I am traveling on the road with the Clippers this year, just like I've done in the last two or three years. As we have a preseason game tonight against the Portland Trail Blazers here in Seattle. Seattle, I'm going to tell you what, Seattle is one of the best, one of the greatest fan bases, one of the greatest basketball cities that the NBA has had. I mean, it's a, it's a shame that they're not here. Of course, they went from Seattle to, you know, OKC to where they're at now. But there has been talks that future expansion that a team will get back to Seattle, which I hope, because this fan base is phenomenal. If you look at the history of Seattle, and the teams and the players and the coaches from Lenny Wilkins to Gary Payton to Detlef Shrimp to Sean Kemp, Jack Sigma back in the day. And this area is full of basketball, wizardry, knowledge. They won a championship NBA title back in the late 70s. But so happy to be on the road and to be here uh, in Seattle because they're playing games. They're kind of planting the seeds a little bit, I think, for a future expansion. I, I can't say that for sure. But I do believe that may be the case, man. And uh, if any any city deserves to have their franchise kind of re- relocated back, uh, Seattle, Washington, uh, is one of those cities, is the city that I truly believe should be able to get that franchise. But uh, welcome, welcome in week two. Last week, we had a great week with Charles Barkley. I mean, Charles just kind of let us know a few things with regards to Western Conference, what he thought, what he thought about the Eastern Conference, what he thought about his next career moves, which I thought was phenomenal. So now we're in the week two, kind of in the preseason, looking at what's going on and what's moving forward. So a couple of things have been on my mind this week, and I'm going to jump into that a little bit more. Also, the top of my head, you know, every year around this time before we start the season, the GMs around the league, they jump in and they have surveys. They have surveys in, with regards to which team will win a title, um, you know, rookie of the year, MVP, some of the best moves. Now, you can take it for granted. You, you, I mean, take it for what it's worth with regards to what the rankings are. You can pick and choose from there. I picked out a couple of different, I thought, key items that I like to discuss from their findings of what the GMs kind of talked about. I'm not going to go into depth on a lot of the other ones. But let me tell you, it, it's good to see kind of what other GMs and what other, other people are thinking about as the year started or the year starts. And then you can kind of compare that during the course of the season, end of the season, to see how much valid- validity was really in those surveys and how close to being right percentage-wise they end up. Like last year, they had the team to win a championship was tied between the Denver Nuggets And the Boston Celtics at about 33%. Well, we saw that the Celtics end up, you know, winning the title. Now, every year that may not be the case, but from from some aspect, last year's kind of predictions did play out a little bit more when the Yama Porsche rookie of the year. So a couple of things that stood out to me this year with this, you know, the GM survey was looking at who they predicted to get back to the finals. And I think this is very important because the Celtics were overwhelmingly favor at 83%. And if you look at the history of the NBA, this is what's interesting about the history of the NBA. I think there's been 16 teams now counting the Celtics that have won 64 games and then won a title. Well, out of those 16 teams, or 15 before Boston, seven of those 15 teams that have won 64-plus games the year before and won a title have went on to repeat. So that bulged pretty well for a Boston Celtics team who didn't have to make a lot of moves, kind of retained their talent, brought everybody back. Uh, they, I think they do have a little chip on their shoulder. It's like it's funny because it seems like that you, you go into and you say, well, how do I get motivated to win a back-to-back title? Because it's extremely difficult to win one, let alone now the arrows are coming at you and you got the X on your back. And how do you motivate yourself to get back, to give the same energy and effort every night? Because Boston set all kind of records offensively last year with the number of games that they won, the amount 
a point spread in which they wanted the domination in the title to finally get over the hump and win it. Now, how do you duplicate that? It's hard to do that. I don't care how professional you are. You need something to motivate yourself. And this summer, uh, with Joe Mazzula, I think probably like, yeah, you guys helped me out. Jalen Brown not being selected to the U.S. 18 twice through the original process. But then when Kawhi Leonard got, uh, went out with an injury, they didn't replace him. Yes, Derek White got on the team, and that's great. But I, I think Jalen Brown felt a little slighted. Of course, what we saw with the games, a couple of games with Jason Tatum not playing in the Olympics, he handled it like a pro. So shout out to Jason Tatum for handling the whole situation during the Olympics of not complaining, uh, not griping about it, kind of being the consummate pro and team player. He's always been like that. Matter of fact, that's who he is. And then post the Olympics, it could have been very easy for Jason Tatum to kind of go off a little bit, but he didn't. And I think this is going to provide the motivation that Joe Mazzula, that coaching staff, the organization probably was searching for in order for them to kind of get back. So, the, you know, the, the survey had them at 83%. Now, one thing I will say about Boston Celtics this year, Al Horford is a little bit older. Can Xavier Tillman kind of step in there and play that role through the course of the season when those minutes for Horford probably will be skewed back? And Christophe Przingis is going to be out for a big portion of the beginning of the season. So where does that lay with the Celtics with regards to their early to mid-season record? And whether that put them in the Eastern Conference, which has revamped because of Philly, the Knicks, of course, and you want to see where Milwaukee is at. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Now they had the Celtics 83%, OKC at 13 And surprisingly, think about this, they had the Mavs right behind at 3%. So two Western Conference teams behind the Celtics. But also, so that just leads me into kind of what, what this thing is, Western Conference, Eastern Conference, and some of the rankings. I think this is going to be very interesting in the West. The last five years, we've had different Western Conference champions, different number one seeds as well. So parity is huge right now in the NBA. And that's what, you know, the NBA has kind of been looking for. You still want your big market teams. But, you know, the next kind of survey I kind of wanted to look at was that GMs looked at Western Conference rankings and they had OKC number one, T-Wolves number two, Nuggets number three, surprising numbers number three, number three, and your Western Conference champs from last year, the Mavs, who improved as number four. So I found that very interesting because I think the Mavs, with the acquisition of bringing in Klay Thompson, uh, also I think acquired a sleeper as Najee Marshall on the defensive end versatility, and then another year of Derek Lively growing and understanding how to play, Whoa. I mean, and then Daniel Gafford, P.J. Washington having camp along with Clay Thompson, a full camp with Kyrie and Luca. I think this is a team that people aren't really looking at that could possibly, I think they could leapfrog Denver and push either OKC or the Nuggets for that 1-2-2 two, two slot in the West if they stay healthy. I think they have the components, they're versatile offensively and defensively. They have some depth on the bench. Another year of Kyrie and Luka trying to figure some things out. Again, the growth of Derek Lively. They can go big. They can play small. Klay Thompson, how he fits in that. You know, he's going to get shots, and now the court is going to be spread a little bit more. Now you put that with P.J. Washington on the opposite wing or in the corner with Klay Thompson. And now you have the two bookends with Kyrie and Luca in the middle. It's going to be a tough team to stop. So keep your eye on that uh, from that perspective. Um, Western Conference is, is, is funny, man. Western Conference is not as defined to me this year. Yes, OKC is up there. I think what, you know, Alex Caruso and – the acquisition of Hardenstein, Hardenstein, it's going to be huge for OKC. Now, the question is, like with any team like that, when you're at the top, how do you handle expectations? 
because last year wasn't the fact that OKC was selected to be at the top of the ledger in the West. So you kind of surprised some teams. You, you, you were able to slow walk some teams and get up there. Now you're expected like the T-Wolves to not only get to the top of the Western Conference, but to possibly win a championship or get to the final. How you deal with that as a young team is going to be very interesting to watch because the expectations right now in OKC is a lot different where Denver, you got some questions because you kind of let KCP go. Is Peyton Watson ready to take that next step? Christian Braun ready to take that next next step? Do they have enough shooting around Joker? Um, So the pressure is not on Denver like it is on OKC. But there's some more pressure on Minnesota because of the acquisition, um, you know, of, of Julius Randle and how that's going to work. So it's going to be interesting in the Western Conference to kind of keep my eye or our eyes on how that kind of shakes out and OKC handles the expectation level, which they set for themselves by being a phenomenal team last year, the next step is always sometimes the hardest step to kind of get over the hump. So I'm looking forward to seeing that this year. And the the last two surveys I kind of want to talk about, I kind of just pick and choose in between. I didn't want to go over everything because you can go on NBA.com and kind of pick that up or, or download it. But the last two I, I think are really good. One is – GM's like, which one player acquisition will make the biggest impact? Of course, it was Paul George at the top. Mikael Bridges and Carl Anthony Towns kind of tied for second. And Alex Caruso was at four. And I, and I agree with that it, with regards to where they're sitting at because Paul George going to, if he's healthy, going to Philly. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the podcast when we talk about is it the Sixers or the Knicks that are the biggest, biggest threat to the Celtics. We'll talk about that. But I'm going to tell you what, quietly, an acquisition that I love that this team fought against last year was Phoenix Suns with Ty's Joe. And you say, why? Because last year, a lot of the conversation coming out, out of Phoenix camp and organization was they don't need a point guard. They don't need a point guard. Bradley Bill, Devin Bookler, Booker or Kevin Durant can not only handle the basketball, initiate the offense, make plays, and they have the ball in their hands. But at times, they got stagnant. A point guard, the beautiful thing about a point guard, a natural point guard, time of possession, time and score, how to get the basketball to key players in key slots and key positions at key times, and understanding time and score and how to manage a game. As well and great of players that the three that I mentioned, Booker, Bill, and Durant are, that's not their forte. So a lot of times the turnovers would be higher. Some of the decisions in late game situations wouldn't be as fluid. The offense wouldn't operate as well in late tight game situations because you didn't have somebody orchestrated. I'm not saying that, that Tyus Jones is going to come in and, and just have the ball all the time. But he settles in, which I think he will settle the offense down with those three players that allow them to do what they do best, which is to beat you off the dribble, make plays, you help, and now they can beat you with the pads. They can beat you with shooting over the top. They can beat you spotting up. And now the pressure is not on the three of them consistently throughout the year to have to initiate the offense, make plays, and then still be able to score the basketball. So to me, that acquisition, that small little acquisition. It's funny because Tyus Jones was left out there for a while. No one picked him up even during the course of last season. And this season during free agency, of why teams, as well as he did in Memphis, and we saw, we, and we got a really good, um, not even, it's not a snippet, we got a really good um, time period to watch Tyus go to work when John Morant was out. And how he can handle it. He's, he's not going to overwhelm you with speed. He's not going to score 20, 25 points a game. But what he's going to do, what he's not going to do is turn the ball. Over. And he's going to run your offense. And he's going to run it efficiently. And he's not going to hurt you. And with the team like the Phoenix Suns, that's all he has to do. He don't have, he don't have, he don't have to do a lot. And that's the beauty. So keep your eye on that acquisition for uh, um, the Phoenix Suns. And if that changes along with, 
Mike Boonholzer right there now, offensively, defensively, what they do. Because remember, Mike Boonholzer and the Milwaukee Bucks were one of the top defensive teams in the league when he was in Milwaukee. So it's going to be a slight change, I think, dynamically of how they play the game and how they think the game offensively and defensively this year for the Suns. And they could creep up and be in that top three, I mean, top four or five teams in the West uh, and maybe even creep up depending on injuries and anything like that. Only problem is the question you go to a little bit is their depth on the bench and how that would affect them. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how Tyus Jones fits in. And, and the last survey I want to talk about real quickly was rookie of the year. We just don't, you know, we, we love NBA loves young players. And it's three, three players who kind of stick out to me. One, Zach Eady in Memphis. I cover Zach at Purdue. And the big question was, as a big guy, could he fit in the league? Because – the inability at times to guard in space on the pick and roll. Uh, does he take up too much space inside uh, and not give your perimeter players enough room to operate? Uh, is this game expansive enough to give you points in the paint? And all of that is true. Zach is a little bit more athletic and has a little bit more foot speed than people think. And I think with John Morant kind of going back to when Steven Adams played uh, for Memphis, He's going to give you rebounding. He's going to give you shot. I mean, rim protection without a doubt. But what people don't understand, Zach can make some plays with the ball in his hands. At Purdue, Matt Painter did a great job. High post, low post, mid post, uh, right around the free throw line area where Zach made plays. And what he's doing now, he's running the court much better. And why is that important? Because if he's running right down the middle of the court, if Memphis gets stops, now you got to suck in a little bit more, and that's going to open it up for guys on the wing to be able to get some open shots. Now, Memphis is starting the season a little bit behind schedule because of the injuries of Vince Williams to also to Jaron Jackson. That That's going to hurt, you know, them early on. So we got to keep our eye on that. But Zach Eady, rookie, Rob Billingham from Kentucky, point guard in Minnesota. How he fits in, his game is dynamic. I mean, if you haven't seen him play, check him out. At Kentucky, he was ultra quick, shot selection. He had the runners. He could pull up, crazy handles. Now he's going to have to figure out how to fit that and work that in and Chris Finch's offense with um, Anthony Edwards. But in preseason, you can kind of real, you can really get a good glimpse of what his skill set is like. As a rookie point guard, he's going to figure out how, how to play. We know that. But I don't think a lot of pressure is going to be put on him because of the likes of the Anthony Edwards and Rudy Gobert and Julius Randle. He's not going to have to do a lot. So I think it will open it up for him to really be an impact player at some point during this season. I don't know when, but I like him. And the last one is Dalton Connect with the uh, Lakers. Of course, we have to talk about the Lakers. But I love Dalton Connect. Size-wise, six 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 seven. that can shoot it. Uh, kind of reminds me of Drazen Petrovic, the way he's built, the way he runs, a little stiffer up top, but quick trigger. And he's going to get a lot of opportunities with Anthony Davis and LeBron James. I think with a healthy uh, Gabe Vincent to be able to penetrate and get some shots. Those three rookies to me, I'm looking out there, there plenty more, but those three kind of stand out to me that I'm looking at that I think you should keep your eye on. Last week when I had the opportunity to have Charles Barkley on, we touched on the Eastern Conference and Boston Celtics, of course, and we talked a little bit about who's the biggest threat. And it was more so Charles kind of sharing his opinion. You know, was it, you know, Milwaukee? Was it, Ball? I mean, was it the, the Sixers or was it the Knicks? And I want to dive into that a little bit more on my thoughts and into why this is a really good opportunity to kind of dive into it and watch it. Now, we we clearly see that the Celtics are the team to beat, deservingly so. It brought everybody back. But the question goes into, is it the Knicks with the acquisition of Carl Towns, or is it the Sixers with Paul George coming over and some other acquisitions that those are the other two teams that, outside of Milwaukee, because we still figure they'll be in the, the hunt, but the more intriguing conversation is, is, is between the Sixers and the Knicks. And it's it's my opinion, this, and it goes a couple of ways, and I'm going to break it down for you like this. When you look at both teams and you look at the rosters on both teams, 
Roster wise, I favor the Sixers. And you say, well, why? I say the depth of the Sixers is stronger to me than what it is with the Knicks. Now, if you look at the starting five to me, top two players, Paul George, Joel Embiid, outweigh what you have from a wing perspective, Mikael Bridges and Carl Anthony Towns. I, I believe Tyrese Maxey and Brunson are a wash. So when you look at the two other really great players, it favors the Sixers. When you look at the bench, by bringing Kyle Lowry back and Kelly Oubre, okay? Now you add a Caleb Martin in there, Eric Gordon, a Reggie Jackson, a campaign, but then you also Andre Drummond, a quality backup for the Sixers. You start to look at it and say, okay, this team, you normally only go eight to nine deep anyway, but you have versatility within that structure for the Sixers. Uh, the Knicks depth, to me, is a little bit behind what we what we uh, what I just illustrated with the Sixers because you got campaign coming off the bench. I think he's a quality veteran. Miles McBride, Precious Achua, good quality big, but not to the I think to the talent wise that we're talking about with the Sixers. Now the big key is going to be Mitchell Robinson. Can he stay healthy? That's going to be the key for the for the Knicks. And then Landry Shaman is also part of that. So when you look at those components. The starting five, the bench, it skews towards the Sixers, in my opinion. Now, the one caveat is health of, one, it's Joel Embiid and Paul George. Where would they be? Paul George played 70 games last year. I think it was with us with the Clippers. Joel Embiid played a large number of games. But this year he's already talked about, I'm not going after the MVP, not going after – you know, leading score, I want to be healthy for the playoffs. So what that really means is that it's going to be some games that he'll probably miss and skew back. Why is that important? Well, it's only been like 10 teams that haven't finished one or two that have won a championship, okay, through the course of the history of the NBA. So it's very important that you finish in that one or two slot. Why? Because, one, if you end up three, or four, you got to go through the number two seed and number one seed, which you don't. You want to meet that number one seed in the conference final. And you do that by securing a number two slot. That's why I think it's very important when we look at this Knicks and Sixers kind of jockeying for position. And I've said this, the roster favors the Sixers. But where I differentiate hustle, the heart, the determination – how they play favors the Knicks, but they got to be healthy. I think Mitchell Robinson has to be in the mix. That little edge with the Knicks on how they play may outweigh the more talented roster of the Sixers. Now, if all is even and the Sixers are healthy, it's going to be extremely tough for the Knicks to knock off that Sixers team with Joel and B and a healthy Paul George. It really is because as well as Mikael Bridges can defend, you have nothing for Joel Embiid. It causes so many problems. Tyrese Maxey, it's, you know, and the veteran leadership of a Kyle Lauren. You know, I think Caleb Martin is underrated acquisition because of his versatility defensively. Now, OG Ananobi is going to be great on the wing for the Knicks a full year. What is role going to be? Can he expand his three-point shooting? That whole thing to me is going to be very intriguing. But I, I love the Sixers and what they did, not just securing the starting lineup, but what they did with their bench. Daryl Morey is taking a lot of heat for what he's done and hasn't done, but how he's kind of restructured and built this roster to make a championship run knowing that Joel Embiid's time to be the most dominant player is starting to trend the other way. Even though he has years ago, he's a 30-year-old young man, but because of all the injuries, listen, you can't count on, you know, five, six, seven, eight years down the line. You got to go get that thing now. Um, I think Daryl Moore did a phenomenal job of filling out the roster of what they had. So healthy, the Sixers, to me, are a better team, if healthy then the Knicks are based on the roster and the depth that they have. So the Eastern Conference, and again, it's 
Boston, and I talked about it, seven out of 15 teams who won 64 plus games and won a championship have repeated. How important that is, health, but also too, that number two slot. That number two slot is very important, not only in the Eastern Conference, but also in the Western Conference. As I talked about a week ago on the, on the introduction to the show, I want to do something that's not just always sports or basketball related, because I think it's so much more to this podcast and what I'm going to try to accomplish. Basketball, sports are one thing, but I have passions with travel, with food, with history, somewhat politics a little bit. But so it's a, it's a set segment that I like to call off the court, that I bring something a little bit different. Now, sometimes like last week, because of the passing of the Kimbe Mutombo, Charles and I touched on his impact, not only with the NBA, but across the world and as an ambassador to the league, but just a human ambassador. And that was basketball related, but it was a little bit more honoring the life of the Kimmy Matama. This week is, this one is totally crazy, bro. This is really off the court. So I was scrolling through and I've been trying to keep my eye on technology, like where we're going in the future, what's going on, AI, how impactful it's going to be, because whether you love it or hate it, deny it or not, it's going to have an impact on what we do in the future. And it may not affect us as much as our kids. I'm older, okay? But it will have an effect. And we're going to see a lot of that residue start to kind of creep up a little bit of where we're going. So I'm going through and I see what Elon Musk did at his presentation, I think it was yesterday, with the robots. Okay, actual robots that now we we have the you know automated driver driverless car. You talk about that. You talk about things that have happened on the assembly line years ago uh, through the auto industry in ways that uh, machinery can create um, you know goods and services. Okay, so you don't have human interaction on that. And now he introduces actual robots made for you as an individual to own and to utilize, utilize in ways like going to the grocery store, uh, water implanted in the house. Uh, he used these visuals uh, in his presentation, whether that's cooking dinner or doing homework with the kids, babysitting, doing all of this. So, and, and, he's, and he's positioning saying that, positioning this and saying that it will free up the economy to be much more efficient because human labor I would think this is what he's saying. Human labor in a lot of these industries won't be necessary. And what that means is, you know, no health insurance. Uh, you don't have to pay for hourly wages, et cetera, et cetera. So now your price of goods that you're going to purchase should go down, should go down, because you're not having the same overhead of human capital to have to pay, which now doesn't increase the cost of the goods and services. In fact, it decreases the cost of goods and services. And this is how it's being positioned that this is the next way where we're going. Now, we've seen it coming all along with regards to, um, you know, having the AI really take over uh, a lot of our writing, a lot of our teaching, a lot of our tools. And now you're having you know, Autobahns basically uh, being a part of society, being friends, being workers, co-workers, whatever you have it. And, and it got me, it got me thinking about this and people in my age category, I'm 53, about to be 54, can understand this. Check this out. When I was growing up, I used to watch a cartoon called The Jetsons. Okay, people got to understand The Jetsons in the 70s. But the original show started in 1962. So the Jetsons, this futuristic uh, city that had one, flying vehicles that were automatic or you can drive it. Two, you had aerospace where cars were flying around. Okay, you, you, you had that. You had interface with the phone or a device where you could talk and see someone on the other end and have that kind of communication. You had robots in the home working at that time with the Jetsons. Again, this is in the 60s. 
Keep in mind, I want you to think about this. And then you also, if you go to the airports now, you have those walkways where now, instead of just walking on the side, instead of an escalator, you know, you see it, you walk on it. There's moving walkway. All of that was in the Jetsons in the 60s and 70s. And here we are today with a lot of these services being offered to us as consumers. It's wild, bro. It is... And technology changes and advances so much, you got to be able to keep your eye on what's going on. And a lot of times we want to fight technology. We want to fight Bitcoin and crypto and one, one world currency and all of that. It's great you want to fight it. But unless you really get to understand what it is and what it's all about, it's either going to affect you negatively or positively when it really takes off. And this is one thing you got to keep your eye on because it does affect, if you're talking about the auto bonds really having an impact on the industry. That means people are also going to lose jobs in the industry. And that will affect families across the board. I don't care where you live. So you got to keep your eye out. I thought it was very interesting of how the proposition was made of how it will help society and the prices of goods going down. But yet and still, you didn't talk about the human component of the loss of jobs and wages and where that shifts to. Because if you're going to shift auto bonds in to take over, where do those physical bodies that worked there before, now where do they transition to still be able to be in the marketplace to support their families? Just something just something to think about and put on your brain. But I want to get that in. Thank you. Thank you for another session, another episode of the Jim Jackson Show. It's been great. It's been fun. I'm here in, it was sunny Seattle yesterday, but it's that time of year. It was a little overcast, but I'm looking forward for the game tonight. Clippers versus Seattle. See you next week, next Thursday. Tune in. Appreciate you. Much love.